all the controls. Yes, it is a big blessing. Okay, I'm going to read today from uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. And before I read, uh, let me just say, whenever you're reading these letters from the Apostle Paul, you know, I sometimes think to myself, uh, when he's writing these, uh, I, just, I just can't imagine that he had any clue that we would be sitting here, let's think about this, 2,000 years in the future from when he wrote these, reading and benefiting from what he wrote. I just, uh, I just can't conceive that, uh, that he th had that in his mind. But on the other hand, Jesus, the one who appeared to him and got him started and gave him the revelation to share, I think he did know. I think it was part of his plan, and that's one reason that the Apostle Paul was specially singled out and chosen. I think uh, definitely Jesus did know that these things that he um, committed to the Apostle Paul, uh, he would share them in such a way that they would be preserved and we would be benefiting from his uh, insights and the things that w was, were revealed to him by Christ. And uh, as you read his uh, letters to these churches, something begins to come through about this man, the Apostle Paul. And that is that he considers, or his, in his mind, in his thinking, uh, what shows up very clearly is he considered that we just really, as Christians, there's just one message that we have. And as a, a minister, he's pretty explicit about that. There's just really one message, and it's the message of the finished work of Christ. And in Paul's mind, what Jesus did on the cross accomplished for us everything that needs to be accomplished and did everything that needs to be done and finished everything that needs to be finished. And as Christians, when we enter in, you see, he did, Christ did the work, and we enter into the benefit of it by nothing more than placing our confidence or our faith or placing our trust in that work, or that finished work of Christ. So for Paul, uh, the message can be boiled down to it's just about Christ and his finished work. Now, he says it different ways. He expresses it, you know, in a variety of ways, but it boils down to that one thing like the banner that's behind me here. Um, it says, by grace through faith. That's how he said it to the Ephesians. By grace, uh, that is to say, God's unmerited favor. You are saved through faith. That's all we bring to it is our, is our faith. And God does the work. Uh, and I think in Paul's mind, like this scripture that the banner says here, by grace you are saved through faith. We sometimes as Christians, we think in a very narrow sense that saved means, well, okay, I can go to heaven when I die, and that's the end of it. But no, I think he, in Paul's mind, it means something much, much bigger than that. Not just the fact that when you get to the end of your life, uh, you have the assurance that, and that's good, I mean, that's important. That is an important thing. But I think in the mind of the Apostle Paul, uh, saved is a word that he uses that implies and means, and also the word grace, which is God's favor. I think he considers that God's favor resting over the entirety of our life, uh, our day-to-day -day life here, and in, you know, in the afterlife, certainly. Uh, when you die, you do go to heaven, that's true. And nobody's worried about a thing in heaven. But right now in this life where we have worries, where we have concerns, where we have difficulties, where we have problems, I think in his mind, the same grace that gives us the assurance of going to heaven when we die, that same grace is active. That same favor of God is active in our lives in the present, here and now, in every moment of our lives. I also sense that Paul had to learn that, had to come to understand that, and that's something he's going to say here in a minute. And then finally, I get the distinct impression that he gets really aggravated. <laughs> when people depart from that simple message uh, and go either adding things to it or, or turning in a different direction. You can sense his aggravation in this letter especially and also in the letter to the Galatians where he's white hot with his frustration and he's just 
you know, I, I sometimes when I read Galatians, I picture like in a cartoon with a little cloud coming out of their head of steam, you know, like he's just steaming mad. And, and he's a little bit that way here, but he's a little more under control when he's writing to the Corinthians. So let me just read a little bit and we'll see what we find. Uh, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And he says uh, to the Corinthians and to us, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. And what he means by that is he is getting ready to uh, defend himself, and he feels the need to do that because evidently the Corinthians had uh, begun to give attention to and follow to some degree other teachers who had other messages that Paul didn't approve of, and so he feels the need to defend himself, and he calls that folly. He's frustrated. He doesn't want to have to do that. He doesn't think he should have to. So, and he says, so bear with me while I you know, defend myself. Verse 2 says, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. In other words, he's saying, using this metaphoric language here, he says, I brought you to Christ, and, uh, and so I'm a little bit jealous about that. And I, I'm, you know, it, I, if you can excuse me, this is what I'm thinking. He says, I, I'm jealous of you because I don't want you distracted by, as he's going to say here in a minute, I brought you to Christ, and it, it, it was, it, that's it. And so, well, here's what he says next, verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So it's pretty clear what he's saying here. He says, I brought you to Christ just like, a, like I have espoused you as a chaste virgin to be married to one husband. And, and I don't want the serpent to come in and you notice what he says here. I'm afraid he's going to corrupt your minds or turn you away after other things. And he said, away from, and what he calls the simplicity that is in Christ. Uh, another way to translate that in the Strong's Concordance, it says that that word could be translated singleness. Singleness or simplicity, it means the same thing. Now, if you want to know what he's, kind of the context of what he means by that, all you got to do is go and reading. So I'm going to read a little bit, and I hope, hope that's okay. Uh, I think you get the context by reading here. He said, for if, if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. In other words, he's saying, you know, I mean, I am transparent, you know exactly who I am and what it is that I preach, because he was with them. Verse 7 says, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted, because I preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. Uh, by the way, that's the Philippians. These Philippians, you know, it's a funny thing about them. When he wrote the letter to the Philippians, he's thanking them for sending him assistance when he was in prison. And here he is saying that when I was with you, Corinthians, he said, I didn't take your money. I didn't take up offerings. Now, that's a remarkable thing about Paul. He didn't, he didn't plan to live on the, the backs of the, the people that listened to him. He, supplied, he says explicitly here, he supplied his own needs. And he said other churches, specifically those Philippians, those crazy Philippians <laughs> who kept sending him help and assistance. Well, you know, they evidently whatever, uh, whatever they got from Paul when he was in Philippi, they were really excited and grateful for it because they kept supporting him wherever he went. That's where Macedonia is. Philippi is the chief city of Macedonia. Um, anyway, he, so he's saying to them, you know, just remember what I was like when I lived uh, there with you in Corinth. Um, let's see, in verse 10 he says, As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Uh, that's where Corinth is. Uh, Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. 
But what I do, uh, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them that desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing that if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast a little. In other words, you know, even if you want to think I'm a fool, well, then let me be a fool and boast about myself just a little bit. He's trying to defend himself and say, you know, uh, these other people who have come and preached to you, now we don't know what exactly they said. You can see from the context there he's aggravated because the Corinthians have been listening to and following some other teaching. We can read between the lines and suppose that it might be the same people that went to Galatia. That's what he was mad with them about in the Galatians. And uh, in, in essence, you can see it more clearly in Galatians, what they told them was, uh, it's not enough. Faith in Christ is not enough. What Paul, Paul's a good man, but you need more than that. You need to follow the Old Testament law. Basically, that's what they told the Galatians. This really gets Paul riled up, because as he sees it, the whole crux of Christianity, the whole essence of Christianity is we put our faith in Christ, and Christ brings us into the favor of God, and we don't add to that, we don't fix that, we don't add anything to that uh, by what we do. It's all His work. And we are just recipients of his grace and his benefit. Anyway, so he goes on saying, I want to get a little further here. Um, what verse was I on, Torin? Uh, 16. Okay, let's go on to 17. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. In other words, what I'm saying right now, this is just me talking. I just want you Corinthians to, to know what I'm, what's going on in my mind here. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For you suffer fools gladly, seeing you yourselves are wise. You can sense the sarcasm here uh, in, in Paul's writing here. Verse 20, for, if you suffer, uh, for you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. Verse 21, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak, howbeit wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. So you get the idea that these people who have come to Corinth, uh, they're saying, hey folks, you, you Gentiles, you need to hear from us, uh, this Hebrews, this Israelite. We'll tell you how it really is here, because we know, Paul's saying, listen, I'm the same, I got the same qualifications they do. Uh, why aren't you listening to me, is what he's saying. Now, now listen to this now. Verse 23. Are they the ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. That means beatings, by the way. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, often. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. That means they beat him with 39 whacks on the back with a, with a whip or a, or a cane. I mean, that's pretty serious. And he says, five times that this has happened to me. And you know, stop for a minute and think, what is it that Paul did that provoked this? You know what, it did, what he did that provoked this? He preached Christ. He preached that you are made right with God, not by what you do, but just purely by your faith in Christ. And Christ did it all. And that made him mad, I, I guess. <laughs> I, I assume that that made him angry. They beat him. Five different times he suffered this. But he just kept on, didn't he? Uh, verse 25, thrice, that's three times, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Uh, he He's just recounting to them. What he's saying here is, listen, folks, this message that I'm doing, this is not just some uh, fleeting uh, idea of mine. This is, I am suffering for this message that I am delivering to you. Verse 27, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger, in thirst, in fastings often, in cold, in nakedness, 
And then, verse 28, he says, Besides those things which are without, that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. He's saying, not only all this beating and shipwrecks and things on the outside, he said, every day I'm on the inside, I am, I'm concerned about people like you, these people I've preached to. He had this, this uh, uh, concern for them. And, you know, if you're a parent, you know how it is with, with your own children when they're out, you know, in, in the world and they're adults. Even still, you have, a, you have this care and concern. That's the same thing Paul is expressing here. Um, same idea. Who is weak, verse 29? I am not weak, and I am not weak. Who is offended, and I burn not? In other words, I'm feeling all the things that are going on with these churches whom he considers his spiritual children. Um, verse 30. If I must needs glory, that means boast, by the way, I will glory or boast of the things which concern my infirmities. That is to say, all the things he just mentioned, all these things that show him to be vulnerable and, uh, and show his weakness. Uh, he said, you know, if I need to boast about something, if you want my resume, if you want my credentials, uh, I'll, I'll, what I just gave you, that's, that's it. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. And then it's like he thinks of one more, verse 32. Oh yeah, in Damascus, the governor under Ar Ar Aretas, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. And through a window, in a basket, I was let down by the wall and escaped his hands. <laughs> you know, he... This is, must have been humiliating. You know, this guy wanted to apprehend him, and so his friends evidently let him out through the window like a thief, you know, like a criminal. And, and so just to escape from this garrison, he's going through all of this difficulty, all of this pain. Now, he didn't write chapter divisions, so he just goes right on into chapter 12. He says, It is not expedient, for, this is chapter 12, verse 1, Tor. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory or to boast. In other words, he says, probably not best that I sit here talking about all this. So, he says, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Um, so, in other words, he's going to turn it around. And instead of talking about all these things that he suffered, he says, let me just tell you about my visions and revelations. In verse 2, this is a little bit, uh, this is like kind of false humility here. Kind of, He's being a little bit sarcastic still. You can tell he's really hot under the collar about this. Because he says, I knew a man in Christ. Uh, he's talking about himself, which will become evident later. So just understand what he's about to say, he's talking about himself. But he says, to, with this sort of uh, you know, mock modesty here, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one was caught up into the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. How he was caught up into paradise. And he heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Uh, that's, uh, that doesn't mean it's illegal. That just means it's, uh, you know, if you, if you look at this in other translations, what he's saying is, I heard things that are hard to put into speech. I saw and heard things that are difficult to express. That's the best way to understand that. Verse 5, of such one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, except in mine infirmities, my weaknesses, my vulnerabilities. Verse 6, for though I would desire to glory, or to boast, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And, verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations. By the way, that's how we know that he was talking about himself, because now he just admits it. I'm the one that had the revelations. Uh, it's very clear now. So he says, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. This is just one more in his list of the things that he is suffering uh, on behalf of this gospel. And now he's saying, It's because of the revelations that I got that I have conveyed to you, this revelation of the finished work of Christ that I am preaching everywhere. Now, please, you know, I know... Some people have this idea uh, being, when he says it was given to me a thorn in the flesh. God didn't give him a thorn in the flesh. God didn't put this. He says it's a messenger of Satan. I don't know how anybody reads this and says, well, God did it. God tried to humble him. No, he said it's a messenger of Satan. You know, God is not Satan. You know, you understand there's a difference between the two. 
And not only that, Satan doesn't work for God. Uh, can I just say that? I mean, I hope you understand that. Satan is not out there saying, okay, God, what do you want me to do now? <laughs> well, I want you to go here and put a thorn on Paul. No, Satan is a rebel. <laughs> Satan is the adversary. Satan is opposed to God. Now, see, if you understand it that way, it makes perfect sense. Here's Paul preaching this great revelation of God that is bringing everyone into this right standing with God, this revelation of grace that sets everyone free from anything the devil could do to them. So what he, you know, it's just logical. He says, I got to put a stop to this guy. I got to put the brakes on this apostle Paul. He's going to clean out, you know, everybody that's under my control. I mean, I'm not going to have any heathen left, you know. They're all going to, everybody's going to be a Christian here pretty soon. Everybody's going to be enjoying the benefits of, of God. Everybody's going to be going to heaven here in a minute. So he said, I got to put a stop to this. So he says, uh, a messenger of Satan was sent to buffet me. Now, he doesn't say what, what he means by this. He just says a thorn in the flesh. It could be what he was talking about before. It could be something else. We just don't know. But the bottom line is, whatever it is, it's a messenger of Satan. So, whatever it is, he did the thing that we would all do. He did too. You see, all the things that he just mentioned, uh, all the difficulties. Would you agree? A lot of difficulties. <laughs> we have difficulties, but probably not like he had difficulties. But it's maybe greater in degree, but it's the same kind of aggravation and frustration. We don't want to deal with those things. We would rather not, of course. And Paul did the thing that is logical to do, and it says in verse 8, it says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Now, we don't know what it is. I presume, I'm just assuming, I'm assuming that when he said, a messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh, to buffet me, I, I assume that he means all of that, you know, all that we just read there about the beatings and the stonings and the shipwrecks and, and all of that. Um, I presume he means that. That sounds like buffeting to me. Doesn't it sound like buffeting to you? That sound, that's what I think he means. I think he says, I think what he's saying is, I perceived and figured out that Satan has sent a, uh, has given some demon an assignment to buffet me. So wherever I go, a riot breaks out and I get stoned and beaten. And, you know, every time I get on a ship, the ship sinks. You know, this, this is not normal, he's saying. So I, he said, I besought the Lord thrice about it, that it might depart from me. That's what we would do, too. Uh, but listen to this now. See, this is why I said, I think, for Paul, this message of the grace of God is an overriding message that deals not with our going to heaven only, but with everything else in our lives. So here's what he said that the Lord said to him in verse 9. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, my favor, my favor over your life is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. That is to say, your weakness. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Now, Paul has freely acknowledged his own weakness, his own inability, his own uh, lack of capacity to deal with all that he has to deal with. So what Jesus is saying to him here is, listen, Paul, I know you're suffering all of these things, but here's what you need to remember. And this is, see, he had to learn this very same thing that he's telling others. The grace of God can take care of it. That's a way to say it. His grace can take care of it. In other words, you don't need to carry it around as a burden. You notice how burdened he sounded in all that list of the, and you know, he was talking about the, uh, the care of all the churches and the worrying about all the people in the churches. And, you know, this would be a tremendous um, kind of um, stress and aggravation and uh, that's not the word I want, anxiety on his part. And what Jesus is saying is, you don't need to carry this, Paul. You don't need to worry about this. You don't need to um, try to figure out how to deal with it. My grace can take care of this. It's sufficient for you. And even though you feel weak, that's okay, because my strength is brought to the forefront. It's made perfect uh, when you realize that you can't handle it. Most gladly, therefore. See, he learned this from this situation. So he says, most gladly, therefore, well, I'd rather glory in my infirmities. That's what he was doing. 
boast about it, that the power of Christ might rest upon me. In other words, he says, I don't mind acknowledging the fact that I don't know what to do. I can't handle it myself. So I just let him handle it, and now the power of Christ rests upon me. Verse 10. Uh, this sounds a little ironic in a way here. Verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. See, I think he's speaking ironically. I don't think he really seriously says, oh, I just can't wait to have more infirmities. But what he's saying here is, here's what he takes pleasure in. Uh, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That is to say, you know, I look at things from a different perspective now. When I have to deal with all of this trouble, I say to myself, you know what, this is just another chance for the power of Christ to intervene. And see, here, think about this. All this that he has recounted here, all of this that he has gone through, here he is still alive, here he is still himself, still strong, still the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians. Evidently, the grace of Christ was enough to bring him to the point where he is now. What he's saying here is, you know, I just realized I don't have to go and worry about all this stuff anymore. I don't have to be afraid or nervous or how am I going to deal with this. The grace of Christ is resting upon me. He's going to be there whatever I confront. Now, when he wrote to the Philippians, you notice he mentioned them earlier when he said those of Macedonia, that's the Philippians. He mentioned them and he says something uh, very much like that, writing to them, and I'm going to read that and conclude with that. This is in Philippians chapter 4. These are passages that we've read before, but I want you to think about it in context of what we just read. Now at this point, this is later, when, the, when he's writing to the Philippians, this is later than that earlier one. See, he'd been through a lot when he wrote to the Corinthians. He mentioned it all. But now, when he's writing to the Philippians, he's at the He's at the tail end of his journey. He's at the, of course, he didn't know that, but he's at the, he's in Nero's dungeon here. And he uh, has been told by the Lord that uh, it's my plan for you to appear before Caesar. You must appear before Caesar. He was going to be a witness before the craziest emperor there ever was. Uh, I mean, a madman, uh, Nero, and Paul was going to... We don't have any record of that. It would be great. I'd love to know how that went. I'd love to know what he said to him. I'll guarantee you, whatever he said, it made an impact. I think, I think there, you can be certain that what he said was the right thing, and it made an impact on that Emperor Nero. For, you know, I don't know what it was, but I'm just pretty sure that what Paul said was the right thing. But we don't know. It's lost to us. And we don't know in the Bible what happened afterwards, but tradition, in the tradition of the early church fathers, the tradition is that at some point afterwards, Paul was put to death by Nero. So Paul didn't know it. But you know what? When you read Philippians, you get a sense that he maybe he did know it. You know, Philippians is where, let me just skip for a second. Torin, if you could give me this one. Philippians chapter 1, when he opens this letter to the Philippians, uh, look at what he says here. You know, I think Paul maybe did realize uh, what he said. Philippians chapter 1, Torin, verse uh, 21. He says, um, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. It sounds like he might have had some sort of a, some insight. You know, you remember when he was getting on the ship and he told them, you know, I have, uh, I, I perceive that this voyage will be with loss and that we shouldn't go right now. I think he had some spiritual perception. And you know what? Even though he saw that, it's like he didn't care. I think he learned the lesson that he was telling the Corinthians. He knew that the grace of Christ was resting upon him, just like it rests on you and me. So he wasn't really concerned here. He says, for me to live, it's Christ. Christ lives in me. And to die, well, that's gain. He said, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, that means my writing to you, my ministering to you is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I do not know. Verse 23, for I am in a strait betwixt two. Now, we don't talk that way. You ever talk that way in your everyday? I'm in a strait betwixt two. That just means I can't decide. <laughs> 
should tell somebody that sometime when you have a decision to make. I am in a strait betwixt two. <laughs> That's, you know, I, I just picture Shakespeare and, you know, the, you know, King James and people, men wearing hose and stuff and fancy hats. And that's how they talked back then, 400 years ago. We don't talk that way. What he's saying is, I can't decide. He says, I can see it both ways. He said, I'm kind of caught in the middle here. Uh, I don't know what I want. I'm not sure. Have a, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. You notice he says to depart and be with Christ is far better. He doesn't have any regrets about it. He says it's far better. And uh, he, you know, here's a man who has been on that other side. Remember he said he was caught up into the third heaven and heard things that are hard. He saw and heard things that made such an impact on him. He says, I don't know how to express to you what, what I saw and heard there. And so whatever it is, he says, you know, I don't have much concern about what goes on in this uh, experience I'm in right now. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. He says it's far better. He didn't just say a little better. He didn't just say, oh, well, you know, not much worse. He said it's far better, far better to depart and be with Christ. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So I get the sense that he did have an idea of what uh, was about to happen. Now, Torn, if you would, take me back over to chapter 4. And there's some really interesting things. Um, let's start with verse 4. Here he is in this dungeon. Here he is facing a appeal before Nero. You know, the other Christians that he ministered to, Paul's other converts, they were all terrified. They all abandoned him. He says that. Uh, just about everybody left him except for, I don't know, I, he mentions it here somewhere. But anyway, the Philippians were not afraid. They sent him assistance. So he's writing to them and he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, in verse 4. Again, I say rejoice. Here he is sitting in a dungeon. Uh, he's saying rejoice. Uh, let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be care Listen to this, verse 6. You remember he said uh, earlier, he said, You know what comes on me daily, the care of all the churches, my, the worry about all these, my converts, and my concern and care and worry about them. But then he got that revelation. The Lord said, you know what, Paul? My grace is sufficient for you. My favor is, is enough uh, for you to deal with your situation. All those things he mentioned. So now he's learned the lesson. And he says, not that I'm worried and I'm concerned and care is resting on me. He says, now he says, writing to the believer, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Torin, uh, just flash up there the Amplified for a second. I like what it says here. It says, do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. You know why he says that? Because of what he said to the Corinthians. He said, I found out that the power of Christ rests upon me. The grace of Christ is resting on me. I don't need to worry. His grace is enough, you see. So he's saying, listen, don't have any... Anxiety, don't fret, have any anxiety about anything, but in every circumstance. Now, how many is that? Well, most of them, <laughs> but just save a few back. No, it's <laughs> in every circumstance, all, in every circumstance. Now, Paul mentioned some of his circumstances. They were pretty serious, weren't they? Now, I think if he can face getting beat with rods, you know, what if you were sitting there looking at the guy with the whip in his hand, saying they're going to whip me 39 times here in a minute. I think I'd have a little anxiety. <laughs> Don't you think so? I think I'd have a little bit of fear. But Paul says here, you know what? What I figured out is they can do anything they want. Anything can happen, but it's not bigger than the grace of Christ that rests upon me. The grace of God that is resting on your life as a Christian is bigger than anything you're going to face. He, so he says, don't fret or have any anxiety about anything, but in every circumstance, in everything, by prayer and petition, definite request with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. That's the way we deal with it. That's how we handle it. Okay, uh, Torrin, I'm going to go back to King James now. I want to read a little more. And then he says, here's what happens, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Here he is sitting in a dungeon with evidently an inkling that Nero is going to do something bad to him. And he says, you know what, here's my advice to you. Don't you have any worry about anything? The peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds. He's not speaking just about them. He's talking about himself as well. 
He's learned this for himself. Verse 8, Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. These are good things to set your mind on instead of the things, in other words, that you might worry about. Verse 9, those things which you both learned and received and heard and have seen in me, do. In other words, wh what you've seen me, see, because he has been the recipient of some revelation. So he said, what you learned and received and heard, saw me doing, and that's what you should do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Verse 10, he's thanking them for their gift. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last, see, he knows, doesn't he? At the last. He knows where he stands. And yet he's talking about rejoicing and don't have any worries, don't have any cares. He says, now at the last, your care of me hath flourished again. He's thanking them for their, uh, their offering. But you lacked opportunity. Verse 11, he says, not that I speak in respect of want. In other words, he's saying, it's not that I wanted something from you, that, I, that I'm begging you for help here. He just wants them to understand this. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned... You see, I've been saying all along, he learned this. He talked about it back there with the Corinthians, how he learned it. I have learned that in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Now, he doesn't mean state of Oklahoma. <laughs> he doesn't mean that. That's another message. <laughs> he's learned whatever state he is, whatever condition he's in, whatever situation he finds himself in. Uh, and when he says content there, you know, I've looked at this in many different translations, other translations. Some of them say things like, the, my favorite one, said, uh, well, actually, I found this, uh, well, where did I find it? I didn't even write it down. Independent of circumstances, instead of content. Uh, he just means, I'm not ruled by whatever circumstance I find myself in. Whatever condition I'm in, says, that doesn't rule me. That doesn't control me. I'm independent of that. Uh, in verse 12, he elaborates a little bit. He says, I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Wow, you know, you might say, how can that be, Apostle Paul? Well, here's what he said in verse 13. All that leads up to this. And this is really a, a good way to sum it up. He says, uh, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That's the grace. You see, we talked earlier, we saw that in Corinthians. He said, uh, Jesus told him, Paul, my grace is enough for you. If you feel weak, don't worry about it. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. So he says, I can deal with all things. I can face anything that uh, comes along because Christ has got enough strength to deal with it. Um, Torin, could you bring up the Amplified? I like what it says here. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I'm self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Now, you know what? Paul's not writing this just so we say, man, that Apostle Paul, he was really, he had something. He's writing that to the Philippians and by extension to us so that we can have the same attitude. He wants to convey this same kind of idea to us. Let me read it to you from the Phillips translation. I like this one too. I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me. Isn't that a good thought? Hey, Torn, uh, go back to verse 11 and give me the message. I like what the message says. Actually, I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstances. Next verse. I'm just as happy with little as with much, as much as with little. I've found the recipe for being happy whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Okay, now he's getting ready to tell us. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through the one who makes me who I am. Isn't that a good thought? I think all of those are really good. Uh, what he's saying here is the same thing he said to the Corinthians. The grace, uh, you see, this is why he started and he said, you know, uh, I don't want your minds to be distracted from the simplicity that is in Christ the singleness. There's just one single focus that we need to keep in clear view. That is, we have come into a state of favor 
with God. And the grace of Christ rests upon our lives. And it's not just something that can take us to heaven when we die. But he, you know, he's mentioned that. Uh, that's part of it. But it's to empower you right in the here and now to deal with whatever it is that you confront. And he's saying this so that you don't have any worry or fear or concern or anxiety because whatever it is that you deal with, he's got a way of dealing with it. He's got the answer. He's got the power to confront anything, even if you feel weak and unable to do it because his strength is made perfect when we feel uh, unable. Okay, I think that's all we got today. Let's all stand up.